So let's start playing. So I'm sitting there in my prompt, and um, the only thing I have in there is like uh, the previous, um, the quote from the previous uh, example. And so I'm gonna start by copying that because um, lazy, I guess. Z zero two. Okay, copy C D. Not C D. I want C P minus R. This guy copied it there, and um, I'm gonna change to that directory. And I'm gonna open up my code editor. Um, and so we can start looking at the code that we had the last time. Um, should I use an array total values? Okay. So we said this section is on array usage, right? Using arrays or array indexing, whatever. So um, here we have a function that calls and that we get called and creates this array and initializes it using the index. So at starting out the array didn't add any index. So one of the things you can do is you can use the print line, print f, sorry, and I can say I want this to be formatted a certain way. And I'm gonna say I want to use percent v backslash n and a percent v just value and uh, let google go decide how what the type is and how to print it okay and so um can do go run main and so huh, oh i have and out of bones stuff here because i was um playing with that last week and so let's make this nine the last element in our array and there we go and so you can see now that it printed out um, our array. Okay, now if I put a pong between here and then I rerun the same code, uh, rerun it now, notice the difference. It says array of 10 integer elements, this open wiggly and so on. And what it's doing with a pong percent V is you're saying I print, print it in a way that is sort of look like the definition. You know, you didn't define it. This is equivalent definition. And I'll show that this is equivalent definition by doing this. And I'll make a global variable, to, so to speak. So I'm gonna say var um, temp equals to, and then I'll essentially temp is equals to an array of 10 integers, which I've initialized. So I've, I'm saying I'm creating an array of 10, 10 element array of integers. And then this open and close square bracket says, these are the values to put in that array. And so now I've initialized it and I'm saving that into temp. So, okay. So, um, you know what? I actually don't need this here anymore. Um, I'm gonna take this out. I'm not gonna call it temp. I'm actually gonna call this test result like we had before, test results. Okay. And so I'm gonna rerun. And you can see it looks the exact same way. Okay, so multiple ways of defining the array. You could define the array as we did before, then initialize the elements. And you can still initialize the elements. Like for example, I can still say test result of eight, because I don't have anything in eight, is equals to 521, 512, for example. And now when that's saved and I rerun my code, you can see 512 is there. So Initializing this way in, in no way makes it read, read only or anything. It's just one way you could start up initializing instead of typing multiple lines like I had before. Okay, so now we see another way of initializing the array, but that's not what I want to talk about. I want to talk about the length of the array, right? And this might come in um, Andy if somebody else is defining the array length and then passing it to you at a, not a part in a program. Maybe it's a big program and you don't have access to the declaration and you, you don't see, um, you don't know how many elements, how big the array is. So Go has a nice Andy function to give you called len, and that's what it is, len for length. And so you just pass the array to len and it returns the size of the array, the length of it. And there we go, 10, All right? That's how easy it is. That's how you calculate the length of any array. And we're going to see, it might seem like it's very useful for array in which you define the size, because I said, maybe good programming practice, the person might have used a constant, so they might have said const, um, number of tests. Results is equals to 10, and then they might have just used that instead, right? And, and that works totally fine too. And so maybe in another part of your program, you really need to actually calculate it 
dynamically like this at runtime because I wouldn't have changed this a static array. It wouldn't have changed the length from whatever was defined. But we're going to pretend that maybe you don't know or you don't have this thing and you wanted to know the length and that's one way of calculating it. Now, one of the other things we talked about was indexing to an array. So you said, saw how we were doing this index. We were um, putting an index for the array and then assigning a value. But we can also do that in a, to, to read a value. So we can say index and then we can do four. And so you know, a test result for. And so like we said before, because arrays are index zero base, when I say four, I'm actually talking about the fifth element, okay? So the fifth element uh, test at uh, four. And so it reads whatever is there. Um, if there's, you know, empty string, if it's zero, whatever. Now, one of the other things that, um, so let me put this back to shorten this a little bit. Um, all right, I can make this size, um, size, and I make this size, keep it short. All right, so one of the things that um, I said here was this was an array of int, but it equally could have been an array of strings, right? Um, let's see the, city names, and then I could put string, and then I'll go this way. I'll say Melbourne. I think that's how. Let's say I spelled it correctly. Right. Don't beat me up if I haven't spelled it correctly. Melbourne, Australia. All right, um, all right, so there we go. Are we run, oh, um, what does it says? New line or something. Uh, so I could put, uh, and then comma there. Um, and then I then print it out. So I created an array and let me just print it out. Bam, bam, um, and name all right and so that's save and then I can run again and so there you go array of strings and those are the values of that array okay and so um, your array can be pretty much be made up of not just ints but strings or whatever you like um, you know we had we know about um, Complex number, right? Complex 64, for example, or even complex 128. Let's go crazy. Why stop there? And we can see, so 128 bits for a per complex number, and each one of these are going to see as a separate element of the array. So each one of these is a complex number. And so we just talking about the real part right now. We don't have any imaginary part. And so that's 128 bits, which is um, 16 bytes. So this array, the size of this array, even though the length of it, if we do length, it's going to be 10. In terms of the number of bytes this array is consuming, it's the size of it, length, 10 times how many bytes per element, which makes sense because the array will need to store that type, so it needs that many bytes. And we cover all about you know, the storage thing and memory and what it looks like when you store a different type and what it could look like. And so for illustration purposes, of course. And so there we go. And... Um, you know, it's storing 75 plus I0, imaginary number. But, you know, if we took that off, still the same thing. Uh, oh, I didn't save yet. Okay, um, those are all my imaginary numbers. And I can, of course, do the length on it, of course. It doesn't matter what, what the array is saving. Length functions still work because it doesn't care. And so there we go, 10. All right, so we, we see that how you can store different types. Now, these are our basic types, but arrays are not limited to just basic types. They're, you can use them very complex types. Uh, complex types are types that you sort of define. 
and Go allow you to define your own type. So you could combine, like, you know, you can create a new type called person, for example. So I can say, for example, I want to create an array of persons. Um, so I have array var people is equals to, you know, is of type um, array of 10 persons, right? And so I have some variable called person. And of course, it's, it's empty now, but where's my, not variable, a type called person. So I get type person struct. And you don't need to know this now because we haven't covered what a struct is or to create your own type. But just an example that I can create some new type called person. And it's empty right now, but I could put different things in there. Integer for age, uh, string for name, a string for social security number, uh, uh, birth date, whatever. I could create another type called date and reuse it within here. My date type would have types for year, month, and, and day. And then, of course, I could reuse date type within my person type to, for birthday, right? So you could nest these things as crazy as you want. And either way, um, the, my, my array here of people would still operate pretty much the same way. So my people array... Like if I did that, um, would still operate pretty much the same way. And we can see that, uh, let's take this out. We don't need um, this anymore. Um, we're going to leave that one. Um, oh, um, so what I wanted to say is that this, um, it, bam, see? So it's saying that oh, each element is a person from the main package and it's empty. That's why I showed an empty bracket. And if I add another type, um, let's do another type called type date. There's stru some structure and it has some hidden set of things in there to represent a date, um, you know, Maybe it has an integer for year or something like the year int, um, you know, month int and day int. Um, um, I can also say date of birth is a date, all right? And of course, my array might have name as a string, for example, and um, age as an integer. And so I don't really focus on what I'm doing here. I just kind of want to show that even when you nest these type um, as much as you like, still this works perfectly fine. So of course it's much longer now. It's harder to see. But the thing still operates like you expect. And I could say, give me the object at in element 4, and um, that still works perfectly fine. Oh, I have to wait till it's save, of course. And so, yes, it's telling me at all. My person type has a uh, date of birth type that is a date from the main package, and that date of birth type contains these value, and of course, a name that is an empty string at age because of the incident. But anyway, so I don't want to get go too far down this thing, but you get the idea that the arrays can be of any types, and we haven't covered type this. So we're going to go back and revisit type. So let me simplify this back to just an integer, um, int. Integer, so an area of integer, and I no longer need that. And um, so, let's say array. So let's go back to printing out our uh, test results, and we can see, bam, bam. Okay, there we go. Right now, sometimes um, so we cover length using length to show the length of an array. Let's put that back. And sometimes we, what we want is to just have a part of an array. So for example, maybe I, we access in the force element here, but maybe I just need a slice of it, right? Or a view, think of slice of, as a view of the array or part of, partial part of the array. And so maybe I just want to see from the first element up to, you know, the first four elements, right? So this is index zero. So I want to start at zero, one, two, three, and I want to stop there. So they can, you can do that. You can put the beginning um, index 
and then one after the ending index. If I want to finish a tree, I actually put in four. So what it's telling me is start at index zero and then go up to the element one less than the, the, this last number here, which is element three. So really what I'm saying um, is I want to go from index zero to three, really. And there's a mathematical way of representing this, um, this notation when we include the lower bounds but exclude the upper one. And that's something like zero, uh, comma, four, and then close parentheses, um, or close parentheses. And it means include zero, um, but exclude index four. And if you wanted to include both um, index from three, zero to four, it would be like that. And if you want to exclude the lower index, but include the upper one, then of course it'd be like that. And then if you want to exclude both lower and upper index, well then yeah, it's like that. Now, if you don't know that from math or it seems confusing, don't worry about it. Just know that oh, this is how you create slices when you create a slice of an array and use the colon in between the lower value, the first value here before on the left side of the colon represent the index you want to start with. And then the one on the right side of the colon represent um, the place where you want to end, but not including it. And so let's see, we should expect to see 0, 1, 2, and 3. So 12 through 9 to 4. And so if we do that, and that's exactly what we did. We have sliced that array. We have created a slice. And notice this doesn't have any size, size in there. We've created a slice um, because this is a cell's behave like an array, but it points to the on the line ar array. That doesn't make sense right now, but we'll see a little bit more about slices in, the, um, in other videos. And so the, this is really good because now I can say uh, this is the lower part of my array, right? And then I can say the upper part of the array is upper part of the array is starting from four, which is index four, which wasn't included before, to the end of the array, which is um, which is ten because I want to go one less than. And so this is the only place where I can use ten and it's not seen as uh, invalid because it's not trying to access the array at 10. It actually goes one less, right? So this is, this is a nice thing to be able to do. Now, um, if you look, here I have I, um, four and four. Why don't I just replace that by a variable? Let's say I'm gonna call this variable i. And so now I can say it all um, i, you know, colon equals to four. And so now I can get the same result. I'm gonna let this save. Um, by using a variable. And the advantage is that now is in code, I can change this very easily and get the correct behavior of splitting my array. Maybe I'm doing some sort of computation where I want to move through the array in a certain way. And so notice, oh, I just changed that variable and I could reshape um, how big each porch, um, the lower part of the array is and how big the upper part of the array is just by using that variable. All right, and then it works perfectly fine. All right, now, um, of course, I can start at index nine too because that's the last place. And so, uh, there you go, bam, bam, right? All right, uh, we know how 10 wouldn't work because that would be an out of bounds. Remember, the first thing here must be a thing. But um, one of the things that I like about this is um, Google Go also give you a short time. Instead of typing, if you want to start from the beginning of array, Instead of typing zero, you could just leave that out. And what this means is colon, whatever number says, oh, I want to start from the beginning of the array, the first in element. And instead of having to type, worry about the length of the array to the end, you know, just leave that out. And so those two things are essentially is exactly the same, right? Where the index for the beginning and the end are going to be calculated for you. And you need not worry about it. Google is going to do the right thing. So that is slicing. Um, we're going to come back, um, and the only thing I can do now is I could say, oh, I want to create a slice called S0. Now I'm going to create this variable a different, slightly different way. Remember, you could say var name and then type, or if you assign in a value, then you can leave off the type, and then Google tell you, okay, figure out the type for you. Or I can say, um, let's do this again. Um, S1 for slice 1 is, you know, I colon. So now 
I can use S1 here and comma S0 here. So what I've done is just took us those same slices, but now I've assigned them to variables. And now they work the exact same way. Um, and you remember I said these slices are like array themselves, projection into the, um, the underlying array. So you can actually say like S0, um, what's one, let's say S0 square bracket two is equals to, uh, let's do, 55, something you can easily see. Okay, 77, uh, maybe 1,010. All right, and here I'll do S1 of two, and don't worry, we're gonna cover um, slices later, and I'm gonna make this 9999. And so, look at, look at that. So, I'm able to, for that slice, I'm able to access element two of that slice because that slice behaves like an array itself, where zero for that slice is here, one and two is here. But within the underlying array, that's still going to fall into wherever it needs to be in the underlying array. And so let's take a quick look and then we're going to end here because I think it's going on too long. And bam, bam. And, oh. Let's let it save, and there you go. As you can see, I'm actually modifying the underlying array. Even though I used two when I operate on this slice, it actually was at location, whatever that was, five or something. Okay, so slices behave, behave just like arrays in that you can do the same thing. You can take length of slice, and that is important because um, when you create a slice, as you saw, all you can create a slice by using the colon operator. Um, you don't, you know, the, the, the length of it can, can vary. So uh, length of S0, for example, and we can see exactly how long that is. Bam, and it's three. And notice, again, if I use a variable here, bam, um, and then I let it save, and that's the thing. But that might seem like, oh, that's a no-brainer because oh, I'm creating my slice. But what if this two did not always start at zero, right? Then um, you don't have to think about the, slice, the length of it because you can have it be calculated. Um, come on. Uh, status index out of range. Uh, oh, that's because when I slice the array now this way, I don't have a offset two. So let's slice it at two, um, two or three, so I can have enough space to be able to access the array there. Okay, so that's what's happening. My array, my slice wasn't big enough to be, give me an offset of two. And so now you can see that, um, again, the length of that slice. And notice I'm still accessing the underlying array. Okay, so I'm gonna end this here. Um, so we did, you can calculate the length of an array. In terms of accessing the array, we saw how you can access element and assign value. We also saw how you can access element to just print it up. That's just using indexing. And we saw that regardless of what the type is, um, the array cleverly um, skip over enough bytes to rep represent each element so that oh, even when you say, I want index zero or index four, it knows how to skip over enough bytes to get to um, that particular element, uh, regardless how big each element is. In the case we did, complex 128 where each element was, you know, 16 bytes. And so even when we did array of five, it knew how many bytes to skip over. And we can look at that calculation, but we don't need it. If we were doing C, C++ on assembly, we'd probably talk about how that's kind of calculated. Some of you might be able to guess, very easy calculation, just some math. And then we look at how you can slice an array. And again, by doing this indexing thing, the reason why slices came in is because we're, again, indexing an array because we're talking about how to do index into an array. And so these, this way of getting a range sort of, of the, the array. Now, um, I don't want to continue this because I think it's going to get too long. So I'm going to stop it here and I'll get to passing or using arrays as function parameters and return type in the next video. So we'll just postpone that. All right, thanks for your time and see you in the next video. Take care.